the demands for money which were made to him were as frequent as the request for the remission of a sentence or for restitution. In most cases he gave. Sometimes he lent, then the loan appeared on the accounts of the intendant general. It was a mere question of account, for the creditor never reclaimed the debts, most frequently on the occasion of a baptism or a marriage. He put the note at the bottom of a basket, covered it with some jewel or sweetmeat, and sent it to the debtor. Some, however, he did not lose sight of, and had kept up the accounts up to 1815. If the sum granted was important, he scrawled an order on the treasury of smaller he took a rouleau from his drawer or, calling a secretary, had it paid out of the petty cash. He did not like to be thanked and would not allow it, even from those most familiar with him, those whom it was his pleasure to load with kindnesses without the trouble of asking for anything. He either sent them away with the gratuity or he slipped into their hand a scrap of paper and on that paper a figure, a big figure of money to be drawn from a staff. There was never any familiarity. He kept to his rank to show that the audience was finished, in most cases a sign of the head, sometimes a glance at the list on the table sufficed. He never gave his hand a century ago shaking hands as a mark of equality, and was scarcely ever used by a superior to an inferior as to kissing hands, which the Bourbons reestablished. Napoleon thought it a little degrading. There were, therefore... None of those external marks so freely used later, which became so commonplace. On a single occasion, it seems, his feelings carried him away. It was in 1815, at the beginning of the Hundred Days, when Monsieur Mollet entered his salon. That Mollet, for him, he proved his confidence and personal esteem by appointing him, at 29 years of age, Counselor of State and Director General of Bridges and Roads. At 33 years, Grand Judge and Minister of Justice, reserving for him the succession to Cambuceres, Arch-Chancellor and Grand Dignitary on that day. Then he went up to Molay, pressed his hand, and embraced him. It is, we may believe, one of the few cases where, in one of his own palaces, he does put aside his imperial dignity. Otherwise, as he said, he would have been clapped on the shoulder every day. At half past nine, the levee, and the audiences should have come to an end, for it is the hour fixed for the déjeuner. But most frequently the audiences lasted until 11 o'clock. The prefect of the palace is waiting, and the déjeuner gets cold. No precaution is taken against poison. The regulation indeed says the dishes from the kitchen, and a confectionery are to be brought in covered, as well as the water, the bread, and the wine. And that as soon as the table is laid out of maitre d'hôtel, was always to remain in charge. But as a table, very small round table, mahogany cannot be placed in the salon in which the emperor is giving audience. The dashing and silver plates with covers surmounted with an eagle and placed on dish warmers filled with hot water, which is renewed as required, goes on simmering in a corner of the antechamber until the emperor gives notice that he wishes to eat. The small tables and quickly arranged and covered with a napkin by the carver, the prefect of the palace, in a fine coat of amaranth embroidered with silver, walks before the emperor and stands near to the table, the service of which is performed by the maitre d'hôtel of the emperor, Guignet. Notice, do not? The Guignet is of a family, all of whom have been employed in the service of the king and of the princes of the house of Bourbon. In other Guignet was still valet de chambre to Louis the Eighteenth. A female Guignet was in charge of the linen of Marie Antoinette. Guignet, called Dunant, was himself the son of a cook of the Prince de Condé, and having served his apprenticeship at the Palais Bourbon, became chef to the Duc de Bourbon, went on his travels, followed him into emigration, and was then his cook. We read out the travels of the army of the Condé. He found a place with the Prince Louis de Bourbon and succeeded in re-entering Paris and was favorably received in the household of the first consul in which he became maitre d'hôtel after the day obtained the place of custodian. At Versailles, Dunant had a yearly salary of 6,000 francs besides frequent gratuities, the largest in 1810, of 3,000 francs. In this royalist origin, he was not exceptional. 
Much of the principal servants, the ushers, and the groups were brought up as he had been, and is curious to find the same names among the servants of the pretender at Hartwell and among those of the emperor at the Tuileries. The major hotel, in a green coat, embroidered with silver, a coat which cost 500 francs, with white waistcoat, black knee breeches, white silk stockings, and shoes with buckles, presented his menu the evening before to the first controlling maitre d'hotel, who discussed it in the office of the control, submitted it to the prefect of the palace on duty, and gave the orders to the appointed and sworn purveyors. The articles of food were delivered, carefully packed, that the office of the control by porters who were known there and approved. Articles were weighed, examined, and measured by a sub-control and then passed on to the maitre d'hotel who personally superintended the execution of his menu. This menu, by the emperor's orders, was very limited and gave no room for the imagination of Dunan to display itself. In 1810, the déjeuner was to consist of one soup, three entrees, two entremets, two dishes of dessert, a cup of coffee, two rolls of bread, and four drink a pile of chambertin. At a later time, the menu was still further reduced and consisted to two soups. A roast, one entremet, two hors d'oeuvres, four plates of dessert, compote, fruit, cheese and sweetmeats, and coffee. And for loud these to be put before him, but he never touched so many dishes. He ate very quickly, not over cleanly, often putting his hands in the dish and making many splashes on the clothes. He followed no particular order, but passed from the entremets to the hors d'oeuvre, and then returned to the roast. He restricted himself to none of the rules usual in the classic repast, and masticated large mouthfuls very imperfectly. It is haste to be done. The meal usually lasted no more than seven or eight minutes. What he preferred was foul with any kind of sauce, poulet, sauté a la province south, without garlic, for garlic disagreed with him. Foul a la tenienne, a la tartare. A la meringo, fowl fricasseed, sautéed or roasted. He was very fond of fried things at a pastry, vol au vent, boucher à la reine, and petit tambour à la milanaise. Also, boudets à la richie, glenelles of poultry, au consommé, and above everything, of macaroni in the Italian way with parmesan cheese. Of fish, he placed before everything red mullet from the Mediterranean. That was one of his treats after Egypt. For a long time, the usual dishes of his table were pilau and dates. But this was one of the fancies, not of his appetite, but of his imagination, just as when he used to believe with great sincerity that he preferred the soldier soup to delicately made soups and valued above all vegetables, potatoes, haricots, and lentils. Those who served him did not willingly admit such tastes, for it was the time when the great French cuisine still had its traditions, when it was still a point of honor within the maitres d'hotel, and when the composition of a menu was an honor or a dishonor to his author, so that when the emperor asked Junan why he never gave him pork crevinettes, a sort of sausage, to never why? And it was because they were ingestible. But really, said he, because he thought them scarcely consistent with good living and scarcely a nature to do honor to the imperial cuisine, the next day he set up Crepinette's partridge. And the emperor found them excellent and ate heartily of them. It was in this, as with his clothes, the pay of a captain is enough for me, he was fond of saying. And in the course of the night, the morning, and the day, he changed his linen and his dress Three times in 24 hours, very fastidious. He would scarcely eat French beans, of which he was very fond, for fear of finding them stringy, which he said had the same effect on him as hairs. And the mere thought of hairs in what he ate turned his stomach. At Cherbourg, however, in May 1811, having taken a fancy to go and breakfast on the mall, he stopped at a guardhouse and had some of the ammunition bread and the soldier's soup brought to him. The first thing he found in the soup was a long hair. In spite of his turning against it, he took the hair out and he ate the soup. But the soldiers were looking at him. Of roast meat, he looked out for the part which was most done, brownest, and he had a horror of underdone meat. The dishes at dejeuner were all served up at once, and he took off the covers himself from the dishes, which were at once removed when the contents did not please him. When it pleased him too much, he scolded Monsieur. Said he to his maitre d'hotel, 
you can see plainly that you make me eat too much. And I don't like that. It makes me uncomfortable. I only wish to have two dishes served. Sometimes he was capricious, which now and then was followed by loss of temper. Too then, having seen that the cabinets of partridge pleased his master, a month afterwards put them again on the menu. Emperor uncovered the dish, got in a rage, pushed the table away, upset it on the carpet, and retired to his study. The servants hastened to clear away the table service, and Junan, like a worthy descendant of Vatau, went at once to the Grand Marshal to give in his resignation. Turok consoled him, sent him back again, told him to prepare his second meal. In fact, the Emperor asked for it. Rustam handed the dejeuner to the emperor who called for his maitre d'hotel. Tunan arrived very mortified and served a roast fowl. The boy complimented him on it, gave him a few taps to the cheek, and said, Ah, Tunan, you are happier as my maitre d'hotel than I am as emperor. He had these ways which were like excuses even to a maitre d'hotel or a valet de chambre after a short outburst of anger rather his fits of impatience which resulted from causes quite removed from the immediate object which provoked them.